Well, good morning. You know, Dixon, I appreciated your devotional about times when remember God's special blessing on your life. And I have that experience when I eat Kansas barbecue. <laughs> what do you know? Burnt ends, you never had it so good until you have that. Well, let me go ahead and pray and then we'll, we'll get started. Father, we come before you grateful for the privilege of being here among God's people. Father, every Sunday is a gift from you as we gather together to love, encourage, and stimulate one another to, to good deeds. And Father, as we sit under your word together and hear your word proclaimed, I pray that our hearts will be stirred to follow you more faithfully, to love you more truly, to have a greater comprehension of your majesty, goodness, and love for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Michelle went away to a Christian college, and as she was there, she noticed a certain young man by the name of Michael. Michael was not only tall and good-looking, he, he was a very serious-minded student, excelling in his studies in linguistics, often one to help others to study for the test. He was a very self-giving man. And Michelle noticed that Michael was kind to, to all people. He was never a flirt. He was kind to all women, treating every one of them, even the ones who don't get asked out ever, um, with dignity and respect. Not only was he excelling in school, he would work at Chick-fil-A, which is what all good Christian college students do. He rapidly ascended and was the shift manager, and while there, he successfully talked many of his co-workers into joining him at church. The other thing about Michael is Michael dearly loved his family, especially his mom, who apparently was suffering from some neurological disease. So when Michael asked out Michelle, Michelle was going to say, of course, right? Wouldn't you, ladies? And so as things progressed, um, they made the ceremonial trip home where Michelle got to meet Michael's family. And when she showed up, she noticed that his mom is in a wheelchair, um, unable to, to speak or move her, her arms or appendages, but her dad was, or his dad, sorry, Michael's dad, was doing a heroic job taking care of her. He'd bathe her, change her, he would interpret her garbled words, and it's clear that this is an extremely faithful man. So naturally, after a trip to see the parents, you know that things are getting serious, and Michelle went to bed and woke up in a cold sweat. Michael wants to be a missionary. What if, what if we have to go overseas if I marry him and, and live off of other people's donations? What if we have to go to a closed country? What if we go to a place that's hostile to the gospel and, and we're persecuted and perhaps our children have to suffer? And then she thought about the neurological disease that his mother had and and decided to do the responsible thing, which is type all the symptoms into Google. And what she came up with and what Google produced alarmed her. Huntington's disease. A genetic neurological disorder that doesn't set in until you're 30 or 50. And if one of your parents has it, you had the 50-50 chance of getting it yourself. And if you have the gene, each of your children have a 50-50 chance of getting it themselves. So if you're Michelle, what do you do? Do you sit down with Michael and say, Michael, I want to know what is your plan? Where will you go? What will you do? How will you fund it? And have you ever considered the fact that you might have Huntington's disease? I want you to get a genetic test. What would that do and what that, would that say about Michael? See, the problem with Michelle is she is so focused on the plan that she loses sight of the person. Now, when it comes to following Jesus, we're often introduced to the concept of following Jesus with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's easy to focus on the plan instead of the person. But the fact of the matter is, 
God does not disclose his plan for your life here on earth. We know about his plan for eternity, but not here. We are blind to the future, but God does reveal himself and ask you to follow him and follow his son in faith. And in Luke chapter 18, we see two examples of people who are blind, but are still called to follow him in faith. Turn with me, if you haven't already, Luke 18, 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing the crowds going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw it gave praise to God. Here we see a tale of two followers. Both of them had a certain type of blindness, didn't they? The disciples were blind to much of the future. The blind man was obviously blind to temporal reality. But both of them, even though they didn't know the future, they did have clear sight of Jesus, and that was enough. You see, we do not know everything. We don't know the plan that God has for your life, but you know the planner. And following in faith means that's enough. Blind faith sees Jesus, and that's enough. And to bring this home, I want to look at these two tales of blindness, the blind faithful and the faith of the blind. And all of this is to focus on blind faith, which is to fix your eyes on Jesus and follow him where he leads, even if you don't know the plans. So we'll look at the blind faithful. Now, to bring this up to, to speed, right, you remember how Jesus just had a conversation with a rich young ruler. This guy was successful. The world was his oyster. He was religious, respected, he was a ruler, had a certain amount of power, and he was young, so it can only go up from here. He had everything the world had to offer, but he didn't have assurance that we'd have the world to come. So we asked Jesus, teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? And remember what Jesus told him? Sell all that you have. Get rid of all that gives you pleasure in this world, and you will have treasure in heaven. Now that phrase, treasure in heaven, causes Peter to think, treasure in heaven? I have sold everything. I dropped my nets. I followed Jesus. What, what's in it for me? And Jesus says in Luke 18, 29, and he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. God has a wonderful plan for me. But it's almost like Jesus hedges a little bit. He explains that sometimes God's plan for your life, while it ends well, often must be trod through a path of pain and suffering because that's what the Messiah will encounter. So before you have these dreams of prosperity, of streets of gold, 
being in the presence of, of God's people forever and ever, you need some perspective. And taking the 12 aside, verse 31, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now, this is the third such statement in, in Luke. And if you were to stop right there, the disciples would have a certain interpretation of this, wouldn't they? They would think, we're going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of David. That is where the Messiah will take his throne. This is the moment we have been waiting for. And everything prophesied by the prophets is going to come to pass. Now, if you are an optimistic disciple, you're thinking he's going to take his throne. This is the time when the Romans finally get it. And as he rises to the top, we, his 12 disciples, will rise with him. But when he talks about everything according to the prophets, he's not necessarily talking about the prophecies of victory, but the prophecies of suffering. Consider Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He utters that on the cross. And foretelling the future of his glorious return in Daniel, we also read Daniel 9, 26. And after 62 weeks, an anointed one, the Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Before the Messiah restores Israel, Zechariah prophesies in Zechariah 13, 7. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And most famously in Isaiah, you have Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, where he looks through the future, looks at the future. This is what he sees. Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Right Before these prophecies are fulfilled before the, the great ones of the kingdom come. There are certain prophecies that must take place. And Jesus gives seven predictions in verse 32. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. First, Jesus will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will not conquer the Gentiles, but be conquered by them. He will be surrendered by his people to Rome. Secondly, he will be mocked. Remember how they put a purple robe on him, put on a kind of a crown of thorns, jeered him as hail king of the Jews. He will be shamefully treated, right? That's shown in everything they really did to him, right? Mocking, flogging, crucifying. He will be spit upon, right? That's an insult. It's a way of defiling someone, showing your personal disdain and rejection. He will be flogged. His back will be lacerated with leather, leather whips. Jesus will be killed. The life force will leave his body after six grueling hours on the cross. But then he will rise again. Death will be defeated. Never to afflict him anymore. He'll be the eternal king of Israel. And then all those wonderful prophecies that we read about in the Old Testament, the good ones, will come true. Now, what's really interesting is he tells the disciples this reality for the third time. And what's the reaction? Verse 34, but they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what he said. They didn't get it. Now, there's a number of reasons why this could have happened. Right? They might have had such a fixation on all the wonderful promises of the Messiah that they didn't really notice those parts that dealt with his suffering. Right? You have this expectation. I know one of my flaws in being this eternal optimist is I, I, I ignore bad news. Right? I remember I used to think everybody's an optimist, but then, you know, things changed. Perhaps they didn't see that the greatest enemy is not Rome, but their sin that needed to be atoned for. But do you know why they didn't see this? In the text it says it was hidden from them. God did not allow them to see it. They didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. 
And do you know what's really fascinating? They didn't understand what Jesus was talking about, but they still kept following him. Isn't that odd? They didn't say, Jesus, before you go any further, before we go up to Jerusalem, can you explain this to us? Do you remember John chapter 6? Jesus fed the 5,000. And then you have this tension where these large crowds follow him, hoping to get another meal. And then Jesus starts saying some really strange things about how you need to drink my blood and eat my flesh. And the disciples, many of the disciples in John 6, 60, when they heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? And, and the crowd just begins to melt away, right? And you just imagine Jesus standing on the hillside, watching people pick up their, their sacks, grab their children, and walk away. And as they're walking away, Jesus says, do you guys want to join them? But then in John 6, 68 through 69, Peter said many stupid things in his life, right? But man, he, he struck gold with this one right here. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Right? When Jesus was saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood, Peter didn't know what that meant. But he knew that those were the words of eternal life, that he is the one who had the words of eternal life. Right? You're the Messiah, Jesus. I mean, we're not going to follow anyone else. They weren't pursuing a plan, but a person. They might have been blind to the future. They didn't know what the future held for them. And if they did, they may not have followed him. But they knew that he was the Messiah. And they would follow him to his death and beyond. It's enough to know who Jesus is to merit you betting your life on him. You may be blind to the future, just like the disciples were. But they have their eyes open to seeing Jesus as who he is and following him. That was the blind faithful. Then moving on, we see the faith of the blind. Verse 35, And as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Now here's a question, and I've, I've had this conversation with our kids. Would you rather be deaf or blind? Would you rather be deaf or blind? And it's kind of personal for me. My mom's sister, my Aunt Kathy, is, is deaf. Um, she contracted some sort of disease, was deaf from the time she was maybe one and a half. And she lived in a different world. Um, communicating with her was, was very difficult because she would sign, and, and any time that she would try to talk, right, it, it, it was very difficult to understand and have a relationship. And, and there's a certain isolation that happens when you are deaf. That's why you have, like, deaf culture, and they live together. They're around each other because they understand each other, and they go to special schools and learn sign language. And, and yes, they can live a normal job, but there's live a normal life and work somewhat of a normal job with assistance, but there is a vulnerability that you have where you can't hear tornado sirens or other warnings. But then you have somebody who's blind, and even though you might be blind, something wrong? I'll do the microphone, how about that? I'll do this, I'll handle it. Is this working better now? How's that? Oh, okay. You know, I kind of tuned out the white noise, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry about that. It's kind of alarming because I forgot about the white noise. I see Scott walking towards me. I'm like, is this like the gong show where I'm going to be removed? <laughs> Maybe being deaf is not so bad. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Okay. So, but you think about being blind, there, there's many things that can make being blind tolerable, right? You can read because of the genius of Louis Braille. Uh, you can have normal conversations with people. In today's information economy, there are ways to have a job. But if you were to go back in time, if you were deaf, at least you could work in the fields, right?
the forces of darkness are conspiring against us. <laughs> Is it working now? All right. But if you were to go back in time, um, if you are blind, there was no braille where you could read. There was no job in an information economy. You could not work in the fields. Uh, walking around would be very treacherous and dangerous. And, and essentially, you were rendered useless to society. And there was a lot of blindness back then. If you were to get into a time machine and step out of the time machine in Jerusalem, you know what the first thing you'd notice? Is the smell. The flies. They lived in a heavily diseased environment. In fact, I looked it up. One of the diseases that was very common was called trachoma, Transfor you know, where uh, a fly would bite you and there'd be some bacteria that would cause the inside of your eyelids to swell up and it would actually turn your eyelashes in and you would scratch your cornea every time you blinked. That combined with wind and dust caused many people to go blind. Before optometrists, I mean, some of you would be blind, right? And it was very common, and even though the Bible had much to say about taking care of the blind, they were regarded as uniquely cursed. They have done something wrong. And often when you see people suffering, one way to turn your heart against them, to harden your heart, is to say they are deserving what they're getting. Remember when Jesus walked by the blind man in John chapter 9? The disciples ask in verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And so when you see this large population of blind people, the idea was they did something to deserve this. They were outcasts. And the only way that a blind man could earn a living was to beg for other people. And that's exactly what this person did. He parked himself outside of Jericho, which was the kind of the Palm Springs of Israel at that time. Uh, Herod built a house there. It was almost this, this big destination for many of the wealthy. Many prominent families lived in Jericho. So it'd be like they're camping outside a town center in Leewood, right? Good place to bake. And hearing the crowd, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I want you to notice something. He asked, who is this? And what did they say? Jesus of Nazareth. Now, does he say, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me? His faith sees him as more than just a carpenter's son from a small podunk town, but as the son of David. He heard about all the, the miracles and the, and the teaching. He heard about this Jesus, and he recognized that this Jesus is the Messiah, and this would have very special significance to him. You see, if you were blind, I'm sure one of your favorite passages would be Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, which says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then shall the lame man leap like deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for the waters break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. When he hears about this new messianic age, he thinks about how when the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be open. And so this man believes that this Jesus is the answer to his prayers. So he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He believed him to be the Messiah. He had the power and the willingness to help him. And then those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Shut up. Leave him alone. Right? This would be like you wives going out to dinner to get the best barbecue in the world in Kansas City. <laughs> and you see Pat Mahomes there. And your husband is saying, Pat, I love you, man. Can I get a selfie? And your wife is saying, Dave, be quiet. Leave him alone. He's trying to enjoy his dinner. See, this man was without shame. In fact, 
there's a, in one account, the blind man approaches Jesus before he gets to Jericho. In the other two accounts, he approaches Jesus and gets healed as he leaves Jericho. And one way to reconcile it is that the blind man starts asking Jesus to heal him as he goes into Jericho and keeps on pleading with him until Jesus leaves Jericho. He was persistent, undeterred. He's told to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He has absolute faith in Messiah. And you know what's really interesting about this blind man? Is he is not too proud to beg. Now, why are people too proud to beg? They want self-sufficiency. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody's help. I'm fine. Well, that's not the thought of this blind man. I'm not fine. My only hope to restore my sight is if this man who I'm convinced is the Messiah has mercy on me. If he has mercy on me, he will change and transform my life. And then in verse 40, and Jesus stopped. The entourage no longer moves. And he commanded him, the blind man, to be brought to him. I mean, what a scene, right? Je Jesus is moving through this crowded city on these crowded streets, su surrounded by his disciples who are doing crowd control. People are telling this blind, my, blind man to be quiet, and finally Jesus just stops and just, tell that blind man over there to, to come over here. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Notice there's a commendation of this man's faith. Jesus hears his pleas, regards his faith, and grants him a taste of the kingdom to come. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Jesus is not some sort of faith healer who's healing migraines and bad backs, right? This is a genuine, bona fide miracle. A man who has been blind is now able to see. This is what happens when the Messiah exercises his power. You see, we live in a cursed planet, right? And the reason why it is cursed is because of the, the disobedience of her forebears. In Genesis 2, 16 through 17, And the Lord God commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And when they ate, the decaying process happened, right? Yeah, there's always an inflection point in all of our lives when we go from gaining strength to losing strength. From gaining hair to losing hair. Right? All of us are in the process of dying. And how we die will vary from person to person. The reason why there's disease and deafness and blindness is because of sin. Therefore, when the Messiah comes, there will be a pushback of the curse. People will be restored physically. But there is another part of the curse, isn't there? It's not just that our eyes grow dim. It's not just that our, our physical bodies are corrupted. But there's also a corruption of the soul. One of the verses I can really relate to is Titus 3, 3 through 5. Titus verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves of various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now that phrase, slaves to various passions, can you relate to that at all? Perhaps you have a temper, or you had a temper that you could never control, that hurt and wounded many people and you couldn't stop. Perhaps uh, the pull of lust was so great you indulged in many various ways that damaged you in your relationship with God and relationship with others. Perhaps it's just that impulse to be selfish, to backbite, to justify yourself. All of us were slaves, right? Slaves to various passions. We couldn't stop sinning if we wanted to. The heart was corrupt. 
But verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The blind man received regeneration of the eyes, but there was a greater thing because he had faith, right? Your faith has made you well. He received regeneration of the heart, the greatest of all blessings. The power of sin was broken. He now had eyes to see. And you know what's really interesting? Immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. Jesus never asked the blind man to follow him, does he? He never asked the blind man to follow him. He asked the rich young ruler to follow him. He doesn't ask the blind man to follow him because when he sees Jesus for who he is, understanding his power, understand that he is a son of David who has mercy, you don't have to tell him to follow him. He knows it because he has faith. And when they saw it, they gave praise to God. Right? This is quite a contrast from the rich young ruler, isn't it? When the rich young ruler approaches Jesus, he refers to him as good teacher. When the blind man hears of Jesus, he refers to him as the son of David. The rich young ruler walks away sad after his encounter with Jesus. The blind man walks away with joy. As I mentioned, the the rich young ruler is asked to follow Jesus and doesn't. The blind man is not asked to follow Jesus, but does. The rich young ruler has all his wealth in this present age, The blind man has nothing, and all of his wealth is in the age to come. His eyes are open to the person of Jesus. Who would you rather be? And, you know, we look at this story, and you think, well, this is a good story. Did he keep on following? Well, in Mark 10, in the parallel account, he's actually named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Now, the fact that he is named is pretty significant, It's not like somebody came up to him and just said, you know, we're planning on writing a gospel about Jesus someday. Could I get your name? The reason why his name is known is because he was still following Jesus and he was likely well known to the audience of Mark. And so there's a little name drop there. This is a man who has his eyes to open to follow Jesus. And just like the disciples previously, he would follow him for the rest of his life. He got it. His eyes were open to Jesus. He saw him as a son of David. Now, he didn't know what the future held, just like the disciples didn't know what their future held, but they knew who planned their future, and that is Jesus Christ. They're blind to the future, but not blind to Jesus. I mean, let's say you decided that you wanted to climb Mount Everest. None of you would do this, but let's just pretend that you decided you wanted to give it a try. Now, there's a couple ways you can go about doing it. You can look at some maps, read some travel reviews, do some internet research, and then you plan and try to execute climbing Mount Everest. How successful do you think you would be? You will never summit it without a guide. You see, when we look at the life before us, God does have a plan for you, but you don't know it. Some of you, God's plan would lead to immediate relief. I think about somebody who has an addiction, right? Following Jesus brings joy right away. Some of you might have a rather comfortable life, but following Jesus will make you uncomfortable. There might be a certain impoverishment. Um, There might be relational tension. You might have a vocational shift where you go to college planning on doing one thing, and then you come out wanting to do another. Jesus may take you through trials and tribulations. Could be a difficult season of health or a difficult season of work. It could be just the the difficulty of trying to raise a family in a world that seems to be dead set against you. Right? There's a lot of things that could happen to us, and we don't know what the future holds, but if you did, would you still follow Jesus? You see, Jesus doesn't come to us and say, here's the plan I have for you. What do you think? Because when you focus on the plan, who are you thinking about? How will this impact me? Rather, the call to follow Jesus is really a call to follow a person. 
You just trust him. And whatever plan he has for you is a good plan. And it will lead you to the destination which we all want, which is heaven, eternal life, right? I think about Adoniram Judson. Do you guys know who Adoniram Judson is? He's the first missionary from the U.S. And he has a very interesting testimony. He actually grew up in a Christian home, but then he went away to, to college. And while he was in college, he befriended a man by the name of Jacob Eames. And Jacob Eames introduced him to a bunch of French intellectuals that caused Adoniram Judson to lose his faith, deny the resurrection, deny the gospel. And so he went around a deist, basically an atheist, before they had evolution to prove you can be an atheist. One night when he was at an inn traveling, he heard the, the death throes of a man in the room next to him. People were going in and out. This man was in obvious pain. And in the morning, he woke up and he asked the clerk, what happened to the guy? And he was informed that the, the man did indeed die. Then he asked him his name, and he was told, Jacob Eames, the man who led him to apostasy. And that shook him to the core. And shortly thereafter, he became a Christian. He enrolled in Andover Theological Seminary, and he decided to heed the call to go to India to be a missionary, the first such missionary from the shores of the U.S., he married one Anne Hazeltine, and in 1812, in February of 1812, they set sail for India. Now, when he set sail, he did not know that by the time he would arrive in India, he would become a Baptist. He actually changed his theology. He did not know that he would actually not end up in India, but in Burma. He did not know that he would not receive or see his first convert until five years of doing ministry. He did not know that he would lose his newborn son, Roger, in 1817 or 1814. He did not know that he would spend 17 months in a primitive prison where he was tortured because they were convinced that they were, he was consorting with the British who was at war with Burma. He did not know that his wife would soon die after his release. He did not know that his daughter would soon die after that. He did not know that, his, that he would get married a, a second time, only to have that wife die. He also didn't know that by the time of his death, there would be 100 churches in Burma and 8,000 believers. If Adoniram Judson knew all those facts, do you think he would have gone? See, Jesus doesn't lead us by detailing the plan. We're blind to the plans. It really is a step of blind faith when it comes to the plans. But when your eyes are open to Jesus, when you understand that he is the Son of God, he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and those who follow him in faith will have new life eternal life, and that he has a plan to take you through the tribulations and persecutions of this world to the golden shores of heaven, when you trust him, you will never be disappointed. And all those tribulations, all that suffering, well, perhaps like Adam Judson, you'll see the fruit of it, right? You may not understand why you have suffered the way you have until you actually get to heaven, right? Right? And so, yes, it is a big step. We talked last week about betting your life on Jesus. It is a big step. It is an act of blind faith. It is something where some of you might want to know all the details before you commit. But Jesus says, I'm not going to give you the details about your plan. But I will reveal enough about me. That on account of my character, what I have done, my power demonstrated and displayed, you know enough to know that you will never be disappointed if you pick up your cross and follow me. God doesn't provide a plan for you, provides a person. And when you follow him in blind faith, 
Your eyes will be open to who he is, and you will never be disappointed. Let's pray. Father, we come before you thankful for Jesus, thankful for who he is, thankful for these wonderful accounts of his mercy and his compassion, thankful that we can be sure that he is the Son of God who the prophets point to, who was resurrected, confident that he is still alive and calling us to follow him. And I pray for anyone here who has not fully surrendered their life to Christ, who are holding back, who are uncertain about what the implications may be. Give them the faith to trust in the person of Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we're going to sing one more song, but if you've been moved to maybe talk to somebody about this, perhaps you haven't made that commitment to follow.